most important of all, we bring our love, the love of our Heavenly Father to you. I've got to, two things to ask of you this morning. <clears throat> One is that you indulge me a wee bit, and the second is I want you to do an exercise with me. But before we get to that, I'd like to read from Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, three. Sorry, chapter 55 and reading from verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and the Lord will have mercy on him and to our God for he will freely pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. Well, the indulgence comes in in the fact that I've uh, got a poem here I want to read with you. And the indulgent part is it's a long poem. It lasts at least five minutes, maybe a wee bit more. But as I read the poem, the exercise I want you to engage in is simply to let your imagination run riot and believe that this is actually happening, what I'm reading. I want us to go for a walk. It's called A Walk on the Other Side. God and I went for a walk, a leisurely two or three paces, stop, look around and chat kind of walk. And as we walked, a raindrop fell from out the sky, translucent, clear as crystal. It struck upon a window pane and lodged there, barely visible. What is that? God asked, pointing. That, I said, is a raindrop. And does that raindrop remind you of something he queried? Yes, I replied, a teardrop. Do you know what a teardrop is? A little water, a little salt, a little mucus, I replied smugly. A teardrop, he said, and I thought, uh-oh, here cometh the first lesson. A teardrop is liquefied emotion. It is joy, it is anguish, laughter, pain, delight, despair. He paused, and for one incredulous moment, I thought he looked overcome, somewhat sheepish, embarrassed by his outburst. And so I blurted out, fancy that. And here was me thinking it was only a drop of water. God looked at me sardonically and silently mouthed, smart Alec. We moved on. Another few steps and then we stopped again. At our feet and on our left, a meadow of dew-tipped grasses dotted here and there with lumps of nodding golden heads. I knelt before one and out of a tangle of green saw a stem, a reddish pink stem, carving delicately upwards, trembling under the weight of a bright yellow blossom. What is that? God asked. I'll tell you what that is. That is a nuisance. That is an absolute nuisance. It gets everywhere. It's a pest, it's a pain, it's a weed, it's a dandelion. But don't tell me, wait, you've got another name for it, haven't you? What do you call a dandelion? A gift. A gift. We walked on, past silver birches, round sturdy oaks, eh, oaks until we came to a flowering hawthorn bush. Do you know we are being watched, he said. 
I froze, then cautiously swiveled my gaze left and right, then over my shoulder. Not there, there. He nodded at the hawthorn bush. Look. I looked and looked and looked again. At first nothing. Then a glint, a gleam, and then eyes, rows and rows of eyes watching every movement. A sparrow, blue tits, coal tits, chaffinch, goldfinch, greenfinch, robin, siskin, every common kind, place kind of bird under the sun, silent, still, watching, staring, staring, but not at me, staring at him. And as I watched, God winked. Slowly, deliberately, God winked. And the hawthorn bush exploded in a riot of color and music and movement, soaring, tumbling, weaving intricate patterns, convoluted sequences, and all the time, their voices blending together in a strangely harmonic cacophony of noise. The dawn chorus, I queried. Mm, not at this time of day, he said. This is what I call the afternoon fandango. And as I watched, the fandango soared upwards, upwards, trailing clouds of earthly glory towards heaven. By this time, daylight was fading fast. Soon trees and bushes were vague, shadowy shapes swiftly disappearing into evening's dark embrace. Then it was full dark. Silently, out of the darkness, came the stars, silver jewels strewn profusely across a deep, deep velvet sky. Parroting a line of poetry and pointing upwards, I said to God, Hmm, are these nails, nail holes, in the floor of heaven letting the glory shine through? He chuckled, no, just the stars, galaxies, clusters. Look, I said, there's Orion, and there's the plough, and there's the Milky Way, but don't tell me. That's not what you call them, is it? They are not your names for them. They are not. I have names for them, and I have a name for all of them. Collectively, I call the stars dream catchers, dream catchers. And he said, I have watched you watching the stars and dreaming. You, young girls, adolescent boys, lovers, would-be astronauts, men and women longing, yearning, hungry for adventure, for visions, for new worlds, and all these dreams drift upwards to be caught by the dream catchers. And there they are. And who knows what I will yet do with all that longing and yearning and wishing. He was quiet for a time and then softly said, just as I have a name for each star, I have a name for each of you, and I have a name, a collective name for all of you, beloved, dearly beloved. I stood transfixed for a time, lost in the wonder of silver stars and golden words, then turned to speak. He was not there. I was quite alone. Silently he had slipped away, but for a few hours over a distance of perhaps a hundred yards, I had seen so much and learned so much. And then from far away, I heard his voice. Read Isaiah 6, verse 3. I did. Holy. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Not three hours, not a hundred yards. The whole earth is full of him.
his glory. Now that poem is it's a work of fiction. It is not true. It did not happen. But that poem contains one important truth. God does not see things the way we see them. My ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. Some of you are here this morning, and you're hurting. You're hurting. And some of you are in pain. And some of you think your life is a mess. A morass of confusion and fear. Some of you may feel pretty useless. Some of you might even feel worthless. Worthless. Well, let me tell you a story about worthless. Years ago in Paris in France, there was an old man. And he was broken. He was homeless. He was desperately ill. And he was admitted to a hospital for the destitute. And two doctors were conducting the ward round. But for some reason, they were speaking in Latin. And they came to this old man's bed. And one said to the other, what are we going to do with this worthless creature? Unknown to them, the old man understood Latin and he could speak Latin. And looking at them, he said, would you call worthless one for whom Christ would dare to die? Would you call worthless one for whom Christ would dare to die? You might be a cheat, and you might be a liar, and you might be a failure. I don't know. But don't you dare, don't you dare ever call yourself worthless. Don't you dare even consider yourself worthless. Because God saw in you something worthy of the death of his son. And that's why he sent Jesus. The first breath Jesus took on earth, he took for you. And the very last breath he expelled on earth, he expelled for you. And even now in the kingdom, he's waiting for the nod from his father to come and take you home. So you ask the question, what does he see in me? What does he see in you? God sees a work in progress. He sees a masterpiece in the making. When you keep struggling to save a dodgy relationship, when you give money, money you can't afford, to some faceless, nameless child in a broken country far away, when you give a kind word, or you keep silent, or you give an apology, and you do not give a bitter, biting, sarcastic remark, but you speak a word, a kind word, that is proof of the Holy Spirit in your life. That is a gentle nudge. A nudge into the fact that you are responding to God's Holy Spirit. That you are working to be like him, like Jesus. And you may not see the small thing you do. But God sees the smallest movement and he knows approval. You are a work in progress. You think me? There's been very little change in my life since I was converted. That might be your perspective. For most of my life, I've worked with horses. Not in a professional capacity, but for a, 
a passion, an all most all-consuming passion for over 70 years. And I've ridden and worked with a lot of young horses. Now, when you mount a young horse for the first time, it's relatively easy to get him to move forward because that's the direction he's facing. But to get him to move backwards, that's a totally different story. To get him to back up at command, that's difficult. And to do so, very, very gently but firmly, you close your legs at his sides and you take a soft grip of the reins. And the moment you feel his muscles moving underneath you, the moment you feel the slightest change in his hoofs, you stop and you get off. And you pat him and you praise him and you make a fuss of him. And you do the same thing the next day. And then the next day and then the next day. And one day he will take a half step back. And then he'll take a full step, two, three. And eventually he will back up on command. But the rider, <coughs> the rider must be so patient and aware aware of an almost imperceptible movement in his muscles, in his body. And so it is with God. God is so incredibly patient. And you may not see it, but he sees and feels that imperceptible movement to try to be like Jesus, to try to think like him, to try to act like him, to try to be obedient with him. A work in progress. For the last five years, the new Fourth Road Bridge has been a work in progress. And in a few months' time, it's going to be completed. It's going to be revealed in all its wonder. Your work will go longer than five years. Your work will go on for the rest of your life. But you are a work in progress and a work, a work that's going to be revealed in the kingdom. If you could see now what you will be then, your knees would buckle in shock. If you looked into a ten-foot mirror, you would not believe the beauty staring back at you. C.S. Lewis said, Immortal souls, if you saw them now, you would be tempted to fall down and worship. That's God's destination for you. That's God's destiny. That is your destiny. But you say to me, what about my failures? What about my failures, my disobedience, what am I besetting sin, the besetting sin that haunts me and I try so hard, but it still holds me? What about your sins? You think he's caring? Didn't stop him from coming in the first place, did it? And it's not going to stop him now. He's not going to back off. You are in his hand. You know, God cannot lie. Did Jesus not say something to you or reveal something to you when first you came to him? Do you not remember he whispered in your ear, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm not talking about you leaving Jesus. We're not talking about you. We're talking about him. He says, I will never leave you. You are in the palm of my hand and no man, nothing will pluck you out of that hand. If we read Romans, Paul talks about heaven and hell, spiritual powers, height, depth, etc., etc. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Don't you dare say you're unworthy, you're worthless. Don't say that. 
you know, they punched him in the face and he took it because he thought it was worth it. And they whipped him within an inch of his life and he took it because he thought it was worth it. And they put the nails in his head and the nails in his body and he took them because he thought it was worth it. And he went down into the awful, aching, lonely, desperate place called hell because it was worth it. Because you're worth it. Because you're worth it. Don't, don't ever say you're worthless. You're not. You think how valuable, how precious. If we really grasp that, we'd be on our knees, on our knees, on our bellies in adoration. We are so, so worth it to him. He gave his son for us. I'm just about finished and I want to, I want to ask you something. I want to dare you to do something. I want to dare you to believe this. Are you listening? I want to dare you to believe this. I look at you, I look around here, and I see apples. I see apples, the apples of God's eye. And I see something else. I see babies, little babies. His little babies and children. Now a child, a small child, can only take tiny steps at a time. But each tiny tossing step is an absolute joy and delight to his or her parents. And God's only looking to his babies. Tiny, tiny little steps. But oh, the joy, oh, the delight he takes in us. He takes in us. You're a work in progress. You're a miracle, but you're a masterpiece in the making. And that's not my perception. That is his perception. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And my ways are not. Thank God for that.